The events discussed in this video took place in the city of Duluth, which is located in northern Georgia. In April 2005, a woman named Jennifer Wilbanks disappeared just four days before her own wedding. Hundreds of people came looking for her, and the story of her disappearance drew the attention of international media. Many women fantasize about the day when they would marry the person they love. They believe that this grand event will be unique in their lives, so they want the wedding ceremony to be at least as good as everyone else's. Making a guest list, choosing a venue, choosing a menu, buying a wedding dress were all exciting moments 32-year-old Jennifer Wilbanks went through. Jennifer Carol Wilbanks was born on February 28, 1973. She has spent her entire life in Georgia where her family, friends, and work have been. It was here in Duluth that she met her fiancé, John Mason, who was also 32 years old. John, like his family as a whole, was financially wealthy. The Masons owned a private medical clinic in Duluth. His friends described him as a kind and caring man, ready to help in time of need. John and Jennifer had been dating for about a year and seemed like the perfect couple. Everyone who knew them was thrilled at the news that they had decided to get married. Preparations for the wedding went their way. The swanky ceremony, to which several hundred guests had been invited, was scheduled for April 30, 2005, which was a Saturday. However, four days before the wedding, on Tuesday, April 26, John Mason reported Jennifer's disappearance to the police. She had gone for an evening run, he said, from which she never returned. He tried to find her on his own, but when he could not, he decided to ask law enforcement for help. The next day, April 27th, a search was organized with more than 300 police officers and volunteers. They searched the wooded area and water bodies along the route Jennifer was supposed to run. In such cases, every minute counts, so the police even involved those officers who were supposed to be off duty. On the same day, April 27th, one of the search teams found possible clues, namely clothing, sneakers, and a strand of long, dark hair. All of the findings were sent to the lab for examination. Jennifer's family posted and handed out flyers with her image in the hope that someone might have seen her or have some important information for the investigation. The media got involved in covering the story. Plus, billboards with Jennifer's image appeared in the city. The police checked the house where she lived with John but it was more of a formality. Detectives found nothing suspicious in the couple's home. On Thursday, April 28, Major Donald Woodruff of the Duluth Police Department announced that Jennifer Wilbanks' disappearance was being treated as a criminal investigation, with the FBI and Georgia Bureau of Investigation involved. A second day of searching yielded no results either. No sign of Jennifer was found. Her family members were shocked by what had happened and did all they could. They asked radio stations and various TV stations to publicize the story of Jennifer's disappearance, suggesting that she might have been kidnapped and taken out of state. They begged the possible kidnapper to release her. The cable news channels swarmed over the incident like flies on a pie. Where was Jennifer? Did something bad occur? She didn't take her purse and keys. She was going to be married in four days during a grand wedding to which she planned to invite 28 chaperones and 600 guests. Not calling her family was not Jennifer's style, her sobbing relatives stressed during press conferences and interviews. In this picture, you can see an unhappy groom, John Mason, comforting his bride's mother. Those who often watch real crime videos have probably already solved this case mentally and guessed who had a hand in Jennifer's disappearance. Answer one question for yourself. Have you figured out who will end up in the dock? John was the last person to see Jennifer alive, and when the search yielded no results, suspicion began to fall on him. The detectives decided to find out who was hiding under the guise of a law-abiding do-gooder who attended church every Sunday and, as his friends say, couldn't even hurt a fly. The man was asked to take a lie detector test, and of course he refused. Instead, he took a private polygraph test in the presence of his lawyer, the results of which were given to the police. However, 
Such a strange and unusual act only increased the detective's suspicions about John Mason. The test results given to the police did not definitively answer the question of whether John was connected to the disappearance of his fiancée. In an attempt to determine whether he had any motive to get rid of Jennifer, detectives conducted a more thorough search of the couple's home, from which they seized three computers. It is important to note that no signs of a struggle or any other crime were found in the house. On Friday, April 29th, the day before her wedding day, Jennifer's relatives offered a $100,000 reward for information that would help find her, dead or alive. Police held a press conference at which officials announced that they were stopping the active part of the search. According to the head of the local police, they must have looked over every possible lead in this town. There were absolutely no clues, and that's why they decided to call off the search in the area. John Mason attended the press conference but did not speak to reporters. Jennifer's uncle suggested that John simply didn't know what to say, which didn't add to the speculation about his involvement in his fiancée's disappearance. In the meantime, it turned out that the clothes, shoes, and lock of hair found on the first day of the search had nothing to do with Jennifer's disappearance. According to police reports, these finds turned out to be just litter. The only suspect who might have had a motive was John. Journalists were at his house around the clock and literally followed him on his heels. There was little doubt that he was involved in the disappearance of the bride, but confirmation had yet to be found. The next day, April 30th, was supposed to be spent at the wedding, but now people were gathering to pray for Jennifer's safe return. On the evening of April 29th, John's phone rang. A number appeared on the screen, but John did not know who it belonged to. When John answered the phone and put it to his ear, he was almost speechless. He heard Jennifer's voice. She reported that she had been kidnapped, taken somewhere, and forced to be intimate. She was crying and said that after all was done, she had been released and now she didn't know where she was. This picture captures John rejoicing that his beloved is alive. I cried, I laughed, I tried to stay calm, to talk to her, to keep her calm, John said. He had no idea yet that his joy would soon be overshadowed by one interesting circumstance. After talking to John, Jennifer called 911. She informed the operator that she had been kidnapped and then released, and that she did not know where she was. The number from which she called was traced as the call was made from a payphone located in Albuquerque, New Mexico, which is more than 1,400 miles from the city of Duluth, Georgia. Police officers were dispatched to the address where the phone was located, and when they arrived, they found Jennifer. Her family thanked all concerned people, as well as the media, who, according to the family, had succeeded in convincing the kidnapper to release Jennifer. When the police took Jennifer to the station, they noticed that her appearance did not match the accounts of what she said. Her captors, whom she described as a man and a woman in their 40s, were doing to her in a blue van with her hands and feet tied inside. The FBI agents who came to talk to Jennifer quickly identified inconsistencies in her story, and when they pointed these inconsistencies out to her, she admitted that no one had kidnapped her. On April 26th, she told John that she was going for a run, but instead went to the station and boarded the bus that brought her to New Mexico. According to her, she did so because she could not stand the pressure and excitement of her upcoming wedding. News outlets found that she had a history of criminal behavior, including three separate charges of shoplifting. In 1996, she stole $37 worth of merchandise from Walmart. In 1997, she was accused of stealing $1,740 worth of merchandise from a supermarket. She was 24 years old at the time. Jennifer repaid the damages and was placed on community service, and after completing that, the theft charges were dropped. In 1998, she was caught stealing again, this time for $98 in damages. She was also accused of stealing from the homes of people who hired her as a nanny. She always managed to avoid imprisonment because the thefts were petty. After her kidnapping story ended, all was well in some sense. Jennifer was found alive and unharmed, but on the other hand, the state of Georgia has spent nearly $60,000 searching for her. 
On April 30th, Jennifer returned to Duluth. To shield herself from the attention of the people and reporters greeting her at the airport, she hid her head under a plaid. There was no more talk of the wedding, which was scheduled for that day, and it was postponed indefinitely. She left Georgia because of the pressures of the wedding, Officer Michael Medrano said. The list of things she needed to get done, and no time to do it, made her feel overwhelmed. It turns out that Miss Wilbanks basically felt the pressure of this large wedding and could not handle it, Duluth Police Chief Randy Belcher added. John turned out to be an abandoned bridegroom who, contrary to rumors, suspicions, and baseless accusations, had nothing to do with his bride's disappearance. Jennifer was dubbed the runaway bride. She publicly apologized to her family, friends, and residents. According to John, the first thing he did when he saw Jennifer again was to give her the engagement ring she had left behind to show that he still wanted to marry her. Just because we haven't walked down the aisle, just because we haven't stood in front of the 500 people and said our I do's, my commitment before God to her was the day I bought that ring and put it on her finger, Mason said on Fox. And I'm not backing down from that now. On May 9, 2005, Jennifer went to a medical facility to address the physical and mental problems that she believed were instrumental in her escape. On May 25, 2005, she was charged with making false statements relating to her abduction. She faced up to five years in prison for this charge. On June 2, 2005, as part of a plea bargain, Jennifer was found guilty of perjury and sentenced to two years probation and 120 hours of community service. She was also ordered to pay just over $15,000 in restitution for expenses incurred by the city in her search. The story doesn't end there, however. In September 2006, Jennifer sued her, now ex-fiancé John Mason. The couple had by this time broken off their engagement and separated. In the lawsuit, Jennifer claimed that while she was in treatment, she gave John power of attorney to act on her behalf. According to her, John sold the rights to their story for half a million dollars to Reagan Media. He used the proceeds to buy a house, which was registered to his name only. Now that they had broken up, John had kicked her out of the house. Jennifer demanded $250,000 in compensation for her share of the house and another $250,000 in damages. John Mason countersued, claiming emotional distress over being left at the altar and suspected involvement in Jennifer's disappearance. In December 2006, both parties dropped their lawsuits. Allegedly, a settlement was reached between them. Thanks to the attention of not only American but also various world media, Jennifer became popular for a while, and some companies wanted to make money from her fame. Hero Builders, a manufacturer of figurines, rushed to create a doll depicting Jennifer Wilbanks in a sports suit with Vegas Baby written on it. Included was a small towel that was placed over the doll's head to imitate the woman's appearance on television when she returned to Duluth. Wilbanks has inspired a runaway bride action figure and a hot sauce called Jennifer's High Tail and Hot Sauce. A musical play based on the story of Jennifer Wilbanks opened on March 13, 2008 at the Red Clay Theater in Duluth, Georgia. A photo of Will Banks appears in the trailer of the 2008 movie about professional poker The Grand, as one of the many women Woody Harrelson's character has been married to in the past. John Mason, who had already once spent a lot of money on a failed wedding where several hundred people had been invited, married another woman in 2008 in a quiet ceremony at his parents' home in Duluth. Jennifer married in 2010, but 11 years later the marriage dissolved and she still lives in Georgia.